Great. Welcome everyone to our Open Sim webinar. My name is Jen Hicks. I'm the Associate Director of our National Center for Simulation and Rehab Research. Uh, and I'll be serving as uh, the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, so I'm pleased to welcome today's presenter. Lucas Kaczynski is joining me here at Stanford University. Uh, and he'll be presenting on robust control strategies for musculoskeletal models using deep reinforcement learning. So OpenSim is a freely available and open source software application for visualizing musculoskeletal structures and simulating movements of both humans and animals. Uh, the application in includes a wide variety of tools, including tools for general purpose inverse dynamics, uh, optimization methods, testing muscle forces and joint forces, uh, and then tools to analyze and visualize the results of simulations. Uh, so the first goal of our webinar series is to showcase the cutting-edge research that's being performed with the OpenSim software. OpenSim is also a large and growing and geographically diverse community of users. So the second goal of our webinar series is to provide a platform so that members of the OpenSim community uh, can communicate their research results and start new collaborations. Uh, before we get started, a few quick reminders about the format of the webinar. Uh, we'd love to answer your questions, but we'll do that at the end of the presentation using the Q&A panel uh, on your WebEx uh, controls. Uh, if you have any, if you need any additional technical help, um, you can ask a question to the host or you can consult the guide on our website. Uh, so with that, now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Uh, so, Lucas Kaczynski is a researcher here in the Mobilize Center at Stanford University, working at the intersection of computer science, statistics, and biomechanics. Uh, he was previously a data scientist in the Computer Human Interaction in Learning and Instruction Group at the EPFL in Switzerland. Uh, his main uh, interests and expertise include computational methods in biomedical data, uh, including applications of machine learning, data mining, big data, time series analysis, and statistics. Uh, and Lucas has also spearheaded uh, a challenge at NIPS, which is one of the biggest machine learning conferences, uh, to bring biomechanics to a brand new community. Uh, and that's what he's going to be telling us about today. So really excited, Lucas. Go ahead. Great. Thank you, Jen, for this introduction. Uh, so as Chen said, I will be talking about the NIPS challenge that we organized and uh, about methods on how to use new um, deep reinforcement learning methods for controlling your OpenSim or um, other musculoskeletal models. Uh, this is joint work with um, people here in the lab at Stanford, especially with Carmichael on, and with 500 collaborators from all over the world. Uh, I will go back to that in a second. But first, let me uh, introduce a class of the problems that we are dealing with um, in our group at Stanford. So here you can see a patient in a gait clinic, and the patient has clearly um, problems with uh, with stable gait. So this is a patient with cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is a neurological disorder that affects uh, movement, that um, affects bone and muscle growth. And uh, in our laboratory, we're uh, thinking about methods for uh, better collecting data and understanding what are the uh, the problems with uh, um, with these gate, pat gate patterns and how can we um, improve current treatments. Now, the typical ways to uh, to deal with this kind of problems is to collect um, the motion capture data on the movement and then use um, expert knowledge to to understand the disease and to um, to provide treatments. Uh, what we are developing in the lab is a software that allows to fit this experimental data to a musculoskeletal model, as you can see here. Um, and uh, we use musculoskeletal models to understand which muscles are affected by, by the disease and how can we guide the treatment um, given the, the data. Now, the problem with the classical approaches is that we normally assume that and uh, after the treatment, the uh, kinematics won't change. So we are trying to understand the parameters of movement, but we are uh, we don't have tools for understanding how this movement will look after the surgery. Now, with modern uh, machine learning techniques, we can hope to um, 
uh, sorry, let me let me show you. So with, with modern machine learning techniques, uh, we can hope to actually synthesize movement after the treatment. And uh, one of the examples of recent research in movement synthesis, you can see here, this is an example from Google DeepMind, where they build a controller for a humanoid robot in a virtual environment to just uh, run through an obstacle course. Uh, now, the problem here is that, well, from the control theory perspective, it's remarkable what they have done here, that there is a complex dynamic system uh, to control, and just by using a black box approach, they managed to build a controller. Now, from medical perspective, that seems not uh, useful in practice. As, as uh, if, if you were told that your surgery will be based on uh, the model like this, you will definitely not be happy with that, and uh, you would run away from the clinic like like the humanoid here. Mm -hmm. uh, now, ideally, we would like to join the two approaches. So we we would like to combine control frameworks from DeepMind and from other deep uh, learning research with the expertise embedded in musculoskeletal models. Um, and that will be the, the topic of today's presentation. So let me start with a short outline. Uh, so first I will introduce the key concepts and problems uh, in uh, reinforcement learning. I will introduce the um, terminology and show you how you can train your first reinforcement learning models. Then I will talk about applications of reinforcement learning in biomechanics, in particular about uh, our collaboration with 500 people, as I, I said, which is uh, the challenge that we that we started, and uh, then I will uh, finish with a short tutorial on how to use our software um, interface between uh, the musculoskeletal modeling OpenSim simulator and uh, the deep reinforcement learning methods available um, open source. Uh, so, what what is reinforcement learning? How how reinforcement learning can help you with your work? So, reinforcement learning as I was mentioning, can allow you to adapt uh, kinematics um, to the new environment. So for example, if you have a model and you change certain parameters, you lengthen the muscle, you can predict with reinforcement learning uh, how the uh, control strategy will, uh, will be adopted to this new environment. Uh, since we can generate uh, new kinematics, we can also generate data for other models, like statistical models. So for example, if you have a small experiment, but you want to generate some data similar to your experimental data, you could use reinforcement learning strategies to, to generate uh, kinematics and uh, joint, um, joint movement. You can, you can use this framework for studying motor control, for studying uh, biomechanics. You can uh, infer some preliminary results and some, some preliminary parameters for your experiments just by running simulations. You can study motor control, muscular synergies, and, and many other elements of, uh, of movement. And fi finally, you can also just synthesize physiologically accurate movement, which could be useful for, for cinema or for, for games. There are many, many other applications uh, related to generation of payments. And now, for uh, this task, we'll use OpenSim. OpenSim is the open source software developed in our laboratory at Stanford. And uh, compared to the Google DeepMind model that I was showing earlier, uh, it's, uh, it has embedded uh, biomechanical constraints on joints and muscles, and uh, uh, in, we hope that it can, can allow us, for the for, for task of motion synthesis, uh, it, it can allow us to generate more accurate movement. So the way OpenSim works is uh, following. So it, it was modeled after uh, how humans generate their movement. So uh, when, when you uh, want to, for example, reach some, something on a table, you first send neural command to your muscles, then the muscles contract and the muscles and tendons generate forces. Now, the great thing about OpenSim is that it allows us to very precisely model uh, the geometry and topology of muscles. And the muscle modeling part is definitely the, the main strength of OpenSim. Now, given those muscles path and um, uh, ge geometries and topologies, um, we get very accurate joint accelerations. And from as soon as we know the accelerations in joints, um, we can run uh, integrators and, and physics engines to um, approximate velocities in joints and then uh, to, to predict the movement given the joint accelerations. Um, and from the movement, we, we normally go, well, humans normally send new, new commands given the new state, 
Um, and that's how OpenSIM is, is designed as well. Now, classical approach and to modeling um, human mechanics, human biomechanics is to uh, go in, a, in some sense the inverse uh, direction. So first we collect the data on movement uh, and uh, from these observations we infer with inverse uh, kinematics and inverse dynamics what are the joint accelerations and we can go all the way back to the neural command. Now in the reinforcement learning world we go um, backwards in a sense. So we start with a neural command and we um, generate all the forces, we, we uh, integrate the forces and we uh, can generate movement. And now reinforcement learning allows us to um, pre predefine certain high level tasks like uh, reaching, grabbing something on the table or walking or running and uh, um, adapting the neural command in, in, in order to, to generate the movement uh, as we, as we pre predefined it. So just let me show you a small teaser of what we can actually achieve here. So here's one example from uh, the challenge that we run. Uh, the company called Nations submitted a controller for musculoskeletal body that can run very quickly. So we, uh, um, the, the, the interesting thing about the, um, the, this approach is that the nation is not a biomechanics company. So they, they managed to build a controller, a very complex controller for a musculoskeletal body just using uh, uh, modern computer science techniques and uh, huge compute resources um, with, with just a small priors on, um, on on biomechanical understanding on of, uh, of motor control. Um, now, um, let's look a little bit more in detail on the reinforcement learning framework. Uh, so, in reinforcement learning, your task is to um, model a policy of an agent interacting with an environment um, who takes actions to optimize certain rewards. So let's go through this, uh, this definition here. So uh, one example of a reinforcement learning setting is where when, we, when you have an agent like a robot interacting with an environment, a maze, uh, trying to get from point A through the maze to point B. So mm, after the robot observes certain parts of the environment, it takes new actions and goes forward or left or right. Uh, and then again, uh, it it's, uh, can, can see its own state in the environment and take new new actions. So this loop uh, is uh, basically the basis of reinforcement learning. Another example of reinforcement learning is when you have a stock exchange agent trying to maximize his profits on the stock exchange market. So uh, he buys and sells uh, certain stocks. Uh, so these are the actions in this case. And here, the environment exchange sees uh, uh, stock or if this cost. What I would like to talk about is the binary example, where whenever you are going to take any Hello? Okay, so let me, uh, since we have some issues with uh, with the connection, let me um, go through this slide once again. Um, so he, here, here I'm describing the framework, the, the the regular reinforcement learning framework. So in the reinforcement reinforcement learning world, uh, we have an agent interacting with an environment, uh, and the agent is taking actions to optimize rewards. Um, Examples of such interactions uh, include, for example, a robot interacting with a maze. So a robot is trying to go from a point A to a point B through a maze. Uh, actions are going forward, left, and right. Uh, observation is the current observation uh, in, in the maze. And then the reward is, for example, getting um, re reaching the goal 
uh, is, is the final objective and the reward is getting as close to as possible to this, uh, this uh, the end of the mix. Now another example is a stock exchange agent trying to maximize his uh, profits in the stock exchange market. So the, the agent is buying and selling stocks, the environment is the stock exchange, and the observation is the current state of the market. Uh, rewards are uh, like discontinuous um, profits from, from the market. Finally, the, the last example comes from your life. Uh, whenever you are um, interacting with the environment, so when you walk or try, you, when you are trying to reach something on the table, uh, you are interacting with the physical world, the environment, your actions are your muscle excitations. And with these muscle excitations, you change a little bit the state of the world, world uh, you get a reward when you uh, perform the task that you wanted to perform, uh, and then you uh, you go back and, and uh, again in, um, again send some actions to your muscles. So let's let's go a little bit deeper into this example. Uh, here is a video of uh, an agent interacting with the environment, um, getting rewards for um, achieving the task. The task is to learn to walk. Um, as you can see, the child is trying uh, hard not to fall. So falling is, again, a re re some kind of, of uh, reward signal that it gets for understanding uh, how to better achieve the task of, of walking. Um, let's zoom in into uh, the elements of the reinforcement learning that appear here. So the agent, agent is this boy. And he tries to achieve the objective. Objective is walking. The reward is uh, are those short-term signals that he's receiving. So when he falls, he he, he feels bad and and learns that uh, he shouldn't fall. And mom claps in her hand, and her hand um, she she gives a signal that um, encourages the child to walk. Uh, so here are the rewards and penalties. Penalty is just a negative reward. So falling is a negative reward. And then uh, we have observations and actions. Observation, what the, what the child observes is, of course, what uh, the child sees with his eyes, um, but also um, the nerves, the sensors in the, in the skin, uh, the sensors in muscles and joints are all, the, um, are, are all uh, parts of the observation here. And the actions are muscle excitations. Um, and finally, uh, the, the, the key um, concept in reinforcement learning is a policy which links observation with action. So uh, the child uh, receives the signal in the spinal cord in the, in the brain uh, and based on the signals um, tries to take actions. And this, this linking and the mapping of observation and action is called a policy. Let's look into details in the policy uh, from a more um, technical perspective. So policy, as I mentioned, maps states to actions. So if you have a state space S and the action space A, the policy is a function from states to actions. I parameterize this policy with the parameter theta here uh, because in practice, uh, a policy in reinforcement learning algorithms uh, is a statistical model parameterized with a certain parameter theta. And theta can be any um, object in uh, some high dimensional space uh, or now, when we trace uh, the policy, when, when we define a policy like this, we can think about our optimization problem or our reinforcement learning problem as a problem where we are trying to um, find the best parameter theta and, and best in the sense of maximizing the rewards throughout the, um, throughout the trial. So we have a trajectory of um, of states or observations um, for a given policy. So the, the policy um, and defines the next state. For, for the starting point, we apply the policy, we get the next state. In the next state, we apply the same policy and then we get the next state. And from this trajectory, uh, given the theta, uh, we can infer the, um, the rewards. And some of those rewards is our total reward, and we want to optimize this quantity. And the example of the policy could be just a linear model, for example. So and when we have a state in some uh, uh, high-dimensional space, uh, 
we can multiply it with a matrix of coefficients of linear regression coefficients and get state of uh, get space of functions. Uh, and then the uh, parameter theta in this case are just the um, coefficients of the um, linear model. Another policy that is now very heavily used in practice is a neural network. No neural network can be seen as a as a model where uh, we have stacked linear regressions. So we start with this uh, state again, uh, six dimensional in this case. Uh, we multiply it with uh, linear with, uh, with, um, mapping matrix to get the hidden hidden layer. Uh, this hidden layer can be any dimension we want. Um, we get some values here, and normally we apply some nonlinearity on this uh, hidden layer. Uh, and then we run another linear regression to get the state, the, the action. Mm. And again, like in this example, what we are trying to optimize are the parameters of theta uh, in such a way that the actions generated by the policy are getting uh, as the highest reward possible. So how we will, uh, now the question is how to find those optimal policies or how to find the parameters of the policy. So normally we start with fixing some policy model like a neural network for example and we want to find just the parameters. We randomly assign the parameters of the policy and then uh, we in interact with the environment. Uh, so we, we, we just use a policy that we have right now, the best policy to explore the environment and after exploring um, the environment more and more we're trying to improve the policy in the direction and uh, that we know that improves the, the outcomes or the rewards. Um, to, to better understand what is happening, let's look on the toy examples. So, uh, we will be looking on a pendulum swing up problem. And the problem here is to twist the pendulum such that it stands uh, upwards. Um, we can apply torques to the joint uh, here. Uh, we can describe the space um, in a two-dimensional um, space. We, we, our observations are in two-dimensional space, so we know the posi position of the pendulum and the current velocity of the pendulum, uh, and we apply torques in order to swing it up. And the reward at every single step is the negative distance from zero velocity and, and zero angle. So we want to stand it up and we want to minimize the velocity. Um, in practice, the exploration of the environment looks like this. So here for a certain policy, we're just applying the policy and we're exploring how good are the, the states. So uh, on the Y and on the X axis, we have the current position of the pendulum, uh, the, the, the current angle, while on the Y axis, we have the current velocity. And now by applying the policy and exploring the environment, we're understanding better and better which states are good for us and which states are the ones to avoid. Mm, so here on this plot, the um, dark regions are the states of very low value, light regions are the states with high, high value. And by running the simulation, we can get a better and better model of uh, what is actually happening in the environment. Uh, and we'll use this information to construct our algorithm for, for solving um, and, uh, this reinforcement learning problem. Uh, I will introduce just one algorithm, uh, policy gradient um, or deep deterministic policy gradient. Um, there, there are many other algorithms available online, but that's we don't have unfortunately time to cover all of them. Uh, but you can find many algorithms in the reinforcement learning literature. So, for our problem, uh, we will define a Q function. The Q function is at the function that I was describing here. So the function that tells us for every state how good is a given state. Uh, in this particular case, the Q function is actually mapping also states and actions to the value. So for every state and every action in a given state, we'll know how good is the action. Uh, at the beginning, we don't know that, but by exploring environments, we'll know better and better uh, what, is, um, what is the value of the state and action. Um, P is the policy that we want to optimize. Again, we are looking for those parameters theta. And now the algorithm goes like this. First, we update our approximation of Q just by exploring the environment. And then we will be trying to optimize this J of theta. So J of theta 
is uh, telling us how good is the parameter theta overall to achieve our goal. Since we have an approximation of the value of the action in a given state, this Q, and we have some uh, trials as already performed in the environment, uh, some, some observations as uh, already captured from the environment, um, we can approximate how good the theta is just from this, this equation. Now, since we are modeling some uh, both Q and P by differentiable functions, so normally the model for Q is another neural network, um, we can differentiate this J of theta and get a gradient of J. And this gradient of J with respect to theta uh, will tell us in which direction we should change theta to achieve a better value in this function. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, the better, better value uh, of the um, policy overall. Uh, so with this stochastic gradient descent, we can, we can arrive at the best parameter theta. Now, let me show you how all this can be used in Bimekan. So here we get to the point where um, we, we are working with all those collaborators from all over the world. The way we um, attracted so many people to work with us on the problem is that we set up a challenge at NIPS conference. NIPS conference is a neural information processing system conference, which is uh, the, one of the biggest conferences at the intersection of machine learning and neuroscience. Um, and the problem we defined for the for the competition is following. We have a musculoskeletal model, musculoskeletal model with 18 muscles and nine degrees of freedom. And we want uh, participants to uh, build a controller to move forward as quickly as possible. And uh, the actual objective is to cover as much distance as possible uh, in 10 seconds. Um, we observe the state of the model, the state of uh, muscles, bones, and joints, positions, and, and rotations. And um, uh, we send muscle excitations as actions. And the reward um, at every single step is the current speed. And that, that's how, so, so, so if we define a reward like this, then if we integrate over the entire trial, we get the distance. Uh, there are some, some details here. So, uh, we also put obstacles in the ground to make the model more robust uh, or to force more robust solutions. Uh, the model is 2D, so it cannot fall sideways uh, to simplify a little bit the problem. And uh, we don't allow users to use experimental data um, just to make it purely reinforcement learning at this, at this stage. Uh, and as I was showing you earlier, the top solutions, the top solution looks like this. And that's uh, really remarkable that without uh, biomechanical constraints on the control itself, we can arrive at a controller uh, that, that runs that quickly and that robustly uh, as here. Now, let's look if it's really quick and robust. So we compared solutions from the challenge with experimental data. And here you can see solutions divided into three categories. And solutions with this running speed at over four meters per second, uh, between three and four meters per second, and below three meters per second. And we have uh, three rows. The first row is a hip angle, the second row is a knee angle, and third is ankle angle. And the black curves are uh, the simulations from our environment, so that the solutions submitted by users, uh, while the gray area is the experimental data uh, with runners running at uh, the speed of four meters per second, um, plus minus two standard deviations. So, so uh, most of the runners are within gray, gray area. Now, as you can see, we are not perfectly matching the kinematics, but we're actually quite close given the simplicity of the model uh, and uh, given the methods that people were using for training, it's remarkable that they are performing that well. Uh, what's interesting is also that we actually got over 100 submissions, so over 100 uh, completely valid uh, control models uh, for this task, which is uh, quite unusual for, for biomechanics com community to have uh, that many control strategies for, for one model. Um, so how did people achieve these results? Uh, they, there are many tricks to, um, in order to make those reinforcement learning methods really work in practice for those complex systems. Uh, and uh, one of the main problems in, uh, in building a controller for, for this task is that we need to very quickly explore the space of possible solutions 
uh, or, or possible policies. Mm, so, in order to explore the space quickly, uh, there were many tricks applied by, by participants. So first, the first trick is to use a so-called frame scape. Um, so, participants were asked to send signals every 10 milliseconds, but actually to constrain the um, solution space and to shrink the solution space, uh, many of them decided to just send signals every uh, 50 milliseconds so that they need to take a smaller number of decisions and uh, they simplify the exploration problem. Another solution is to uh, use binary actions instead of excitations between zero and one. Uh, so again, uh, this constrains the solution space and uh, the, 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 um, it speeds up the exploration. Finally, they used reward shaping, which is something that, um, again, uh, has its correspondence to what we do in, in real life. So uh, when we learn how to walk, we may have our mom clapping behind us uh, just to reinforce certain activities. Uh, but later in, the, in our life, we don't have our mom uh, clapping. So we actually have some extra signals, extra rewards uh, to just learn faster. And in this case, uh, people were, for example, adding extra penalty for falling uh, or for um, having pelvis too low or, or uh, trying to encourage uh, moving just one leg at a time or, or things like this. So encouraging certain um, behaviors allows us to explore only the parts of the space but which are relevant for, for the task. Um, so as you can um, imagine, that was uh, great success. Like the challenge was uh, very interesting for the reinforcement learning community because we, they were asked to solve the problem which seemed more relevant uh, to uh, in practice in, in the medical world. Uh, we, we got over 400 per teams participating, so over 500 participants. Um, people were submitting their solutions to Crowd AI platform. In the Crowd, Crowd AI platform, they could see the, uh, the video of their um, solution. So, um, this again uh, encouraged the uh, participations. Um, we got great sponsors. So NVIDIA sponsored a uh, computer for $70,000 as the first prize. We, get, uh, we got um, cloud credits from Amazon for the participants to, to train their models, and we got a lot of media attention as well. So this all encouraged us to start another challenge this year. And in 2018, uh, we submitted this challenge uh, where participants were asked to control a, prosthesis, uh, a model with a prosthetic leg. So now we have 19 muscles, 14 degrees of freedom. The task is to match, match certain velocity vector. And the model is 3D now, so it can fall sideways to, to make things slightly more difficult. And uh, this time we allow them to use experimental data. There is no experimental data for this particular environment since we designed the prosthesis just for the challenge. But you can, for example, try to train your model uh, without a prosthetic leg, normal model, uh, and then start uh, training the model with a prosthesis from a model uh, used for, for normal walking. Uh, that can significantly speed up the training, for example. Mm, there are many incentives for users to, to participate. So here we are solving a real medical problem, so you can kind of contribute to humanity with, uh, with, with your solutions. We have travel grants to Stanford and EPFL for top participants. Uh, again, uh, Google, this time Google sponsors um, cloud credits for participants to start their training. Uh, we have $250 for uh, top 400 participants um, submitting their solutions this month. And then we have four GPUs from NVIDIA for top um, participants in the, in the, in the challenge. So now I will quickly tell you about the uh, software that you can use for the challenge or for your OpenSIM projects and to leverage reinforcement learning. So it's called OSIM RL. And OSIM RL is um, an interface for building robust controllers for your OpenSIM models using deep reinforcement learning uh, algorithms. Um, the idea is that uh, we have a great expertise embedded in OpenSIM models. And there's a lot of interest um, now in, in creating new deep reinforcement learning models from machine learning community. Uh, so OpenSim uh, is a layer on top of Open OpenSim RL is a layer on top of OpenSim, which basically uh, 
provides three simple functions which you can just uh, use to plug in the reinforcement learning algorithms. And to install um, OCMRL, you can just go to this website here and there, with five lines of code, uh, you, you, you can install the entire environment and run your first simulations. Let's, let me show you how it looks in practice. Uh, so to, to run an, um, a simulation, you basically will need five line, lines of code. You'll need to create the environment. So here's the prosthetics environment, but uh, you can load any other model that you like. Um, you can get your first observation by just resetting the environment. And then yeah, you can run 200 um, steps of the simulation uh, just by taking environment step function. Now here the brain action is the policy action. So I'm here, I'm assuming that there is some policy already pre-trained uh, that takes observations, uh, outputs the actions. Those actions are then plugged into the step function. The step function gives us the next observation. Uh, how does that link to, to what is happening in the open sim? Uh, so open sim model, um, general model looks like this, as I introduced you to you at the very beginning. Now the environment is this red part of the open sim. So the entire environment function takes care of all the muscle dynamics, our bone ge geometry and muscle geometry. It uh, can compute joint accelerations and generate movement. And it's all embedded in the environment in this, uh, in this uh, scenario. Now, observation is just movement. And uh, the policy is the brain taking action given the observation. So the, the movement goes back to our neural command and neural command is the brain that we are trying to train uh, using reinforcement learning. Uh, so let me show you how that will look, how that looks in practice. Uh, so we will be using uh, is it? Sorry, uh, can you, yeah. Okay, uh, sorry for this interruption. So I will show you right away um, how can we run the environment that, that I was showing you at the previous slide. Um, we'll be working on with the ARM model. So ARM model, uh, the ARM model is a model with two degrees of freedom and six muscles, um, where we, and we are trying to grab a ball in the, uh, in the space. I will show you uh, that in a, in a second. So let's, um, let me share my screen. So uh, we will be using Jupyter Notebook for this example. Uh, and I have the environment prepared in the Jupyter Notebook and the link is uh, in the in the slides that you will be getting after uh, after the webinar. Uh, so basically to, to run the Jupyter Notebook you will just need to run those six commands here. Um, assuming that everything is installed correctly. Now in order to train your controllers using reinforcement learning um, for OpenSim uh, you will need to load certain libraries. So the libraries here are mainly the um, RL library, Keras RL, which will take care of training the model, and um, uh, OpenSim library that, that just loads the environment. Um, now to start the ARM model, you just load the ARM environment and you start the environment, as I was showing in the slides. Um, the environment will show up like this first. And then you can create your policy model. The policy model is a neural network that takes a uh, um, current observation and outputs the action. And then the Q network is the model, the current model of the state space, uh, state action space and value of the state action uh, point. 
um, as I was describing in the VDPG algorithm. And then finally, the terrors are all given those two neural networks will train them. The training, uh, so, so here are the, all the parameters that are quite crucial for getting the, the right um, optimization process. Uh, you can uh, find them in the um, documentation of the um, of the Keras URL package. Um, but basically, once everything is set up, you just start training your model, and you can see um, how the training procedure uh, looks like in practice. So here we just randomly activate muscles, um, and uh, the open sim is taking care of the physics in the environment. The model is trying to reach to grab the green ball, uh, and after many many iterations, it will be able to uh, to activate muscles in a way to, to to reach for for the ball. Now, just quick uh, demo demo of how you can load your own model. So I prepared for this webinar another model uh, that you can use for for plugging in um, your your own things. So here we are loading another OpenSim model. We are defining certain reward function. Uh, the reward here will be just trying not to move center of mass, uh, so trying to simulate just standing still. Uh, and there is an extra penalty for uh, for having a pelvis too low. So given this environment, uh, we can run everything else just by changing the environment here. So uh, let's load the environment from webinar board and environment and then um, and we just need to create the environment so uh, let's let's see what we get so again I lo load the libraries I create the environment I create the uh, networks that we need for control and for the training of the algorithm. Uh, I set up the um, algorithm for training, and I start fitting the model. Now we have a different model uh, where it tries to learn how to stand. So again, by applying some um, the current policy with some noise, it explores the environment and learns how to uh, how to stand still. It will take a while to to learn, uh, and we don't have time for that, but um, that this way you can plug any other um, any other model that you want to train just by changing the name of the model and by defining the reward function. So now the last slide is a summary of, of what, what we've learned. So uh, I try to introduce mainly the two concepts. So first, uh, reinforcement learning uh, is the methodology that allows you to build robust controllers uh, for just by specifying high-level objectives for your model, like grabbing something or uh, or walking. OpenSim RL is the package that allows to leverage all the research in reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning uh, to build controllers for your OpenSim models. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you, Lucas, for a great presentation. Really exciting, really interesting. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we'll now have time to answer your questions. So if you have a question, uh, please find the Q&A um, panel in your WebEx controls. Go ahead and type in the question, um, and please select to ask all panelists. So let's see. Uh, so one question from Ian Danforth. Uh, so does the paper you mentioned go into detail on the uh, non ascent solutions? Um, yeah, so the nation solution will be published in the NIPS competition book. It's not yet uh, published, but it should be ready in, within a month. But, but, but definitely you can um, reach out to nations and they will, uh, they will give you a preprint -pre of, the, of the paper. All right, now a, a question uh, from Alexi Grinchak. 
Uh, hello, could you please elaborate on the second stage of the competition? Uh, when will it be released? Uh, second stage of the current niche 2018 competition. So, so that's that's right. That's something that I didn't mention is that um, we divided the competition into two stages. And one of the, in the first stage, we are just asking participants to uh, just make this model with a prosthesis to, to walk three meters per second. Um, we want to explore how uh, how difficult the problem is uh, right now, and then. Uh, in this month, month, we are preparing the second stage of the competition where uh, they will be asked to uh, match a velocity vector, uh, which is different than just, just going forward three meters per second. Uh, we are still tuning the difficulty of the problem uh, just based on the, the current results. Uh, so, so by the end of the month, we should have the, uh, the current um, definition of the second stage. Okay, great. Thanks. So now a question from Zhao Zhu. Um, is the code in your paper available online? Right. So all the tools that we used for the challenge um, are, are uh, available and all the tools are open source. That includes the OpenSim itself, the entire physics simulation, um, or the muscle simulator, and the Crowd AI platform on which we are running the, the challenge is available, and then our uh, solutions uh, for the challenge or top solutions from the challenge are also available. So we ask top participants to publish their code. Uh, the environment itself is also open source. So everything that we could have made open source is open source and on GitHub. Awesome. Uh, so now a question from Vishal Ravindranathan. Um, so I would like to know if it's really as simple as you've shown in the tutorial. Uh, if I don't have any um, prerequisite knowledge in re reinforcement learning, but I do have a sound knowledge in biomechanics, how quickly would I be able to get the hang of it? Great. So depending on the complexity of the uh, model, it might be easier or harder. So for this ARM uh, 2D model, you can learn how to, you, you can train an algorithm quite quickly without uh, machine learning knowledge for and uh, running challenge it was really a challenge and many teams were trying to tune the parameters in order to make it, make it learn as quickly as possible. So the, the harder, the, the more difficult the postcostal model is, the harder it is to train. Uh, hopefully these things will get easier and easier in, in the future, but uh, uh, for complex models, it's good to team up with a machine learning person at the moment. Okay, are there any, is there any way that, you know, folks if there are biomechanics folks could try to pair up with machine, is there a right. forum or anything? Um, right, so, so around the challenge, we have a fairly large community of, of participants already, and participants are mainly from computer science community. So they are definitely willing to collaborate on building controllers and uh, getting more uh, information about uh, motor control from experts in motor control or like from biomechanics. Uh, and uh, that's uh, it's probably good to just contact them through forum and and uh, um, just just collaborate on both control problems and biomechanics problems. Okay, so we'll make sure that we have a link in the right. forum, and you could just post a note that you're interested, what your background is, and um, pair up with someone that way. Right. Okay, now a question from Tom Vandenbogert. Um, how many simulations are typically needed before you start to see good movement? Um, and how does this depend on the number of layers in the neural network? So uh, the neural network models are normally quite simple for reinforcement learning. So there are three or four layers uh, and, and not that many parameters, actually, like an um, order of magnitude of 30 or 100. Um, the problem is that the exploration of the space takes time. So now if the model, if the space uh, of space is small, like the, in the ARM 2D model, you can get results within an hour. Now for the model that we gave for the challenge, people were training their models for a week on um, a solid, strong computer with like 30 CPUs. So depending on the complexity of the model, the exploration is harder or easier. and uh, 
that can um, affect how quickly you, you you can you can get the solution. Great. Uh, now a question from Wellington Pinheiro. Um you like you would like to know which criteria are you using to define the control as robust? What kind of uncertainties are considered? Right. So de depending on what you actually need for for your particular task, uh, you can introduce some external noise in the uh, observations, for example, or um, for, for for the challenge, we just put obstacles on the ground, uh, and that was um, uh, the, in, in the in the challenge we didn't want to have uh, solutions which are purely based on on the data, for example, uh, and putting obstacles made it difficult enough for for training and uh, just using experimental data. Uh, in many scenarios, you don't robustness is not that important actually. If we just want to generate something that is that looks feasible, um, so I, I would say that this really depends on the task. But you can introduce as much uh, difficulty as you want, and that will make the model more robust. And robust means that it's not falling over and, right. and achieves the the task. Right. In our challenge, yeah. it was going to fine. So now a question from Ro Pang Sun. Uh, thanks for the inter interesting presentation. I wonder if adding upper trunk and arm muscles in the model would be a goal for the future, uh, given that they play a critical role in stability control during locomotion. Right. So, can I do the next one? Uh, sure, I can. Uh, yeah, hi everyone, I'm Carmichael. I'm a, I'm a grad student. I was working on the biomechanics part. Um, of this collaboration. Um, arm swing is really important and especially important in running. There's a lot of information that it um, counteracts some of the angular momentum of the legs. Um, I think in, I think it depends on the problem. It's definitely important. Uh, it's probably more passive in something like walking than in running, um, but definitely for looking at running, it's going to be really important to look at the upper trunk and the, um, sorry, the, the trunk and, and the uh, upper limbs. Mm -hmm. Okay, now a question from Ree Gerchik. Uh, are users able to modify the mapping policy? Right, so um, in the current implementation, we don't really assume any uh, structure of the controller. In the reinforcement learning world, people are mainly using neural networks. And now, uh, once we have a statistical model complex enough to, to, to really be able to, to, to control such a system. Uh, it's, uh, it's not that the entire methodology is not, uh, it's, it's, it's robust to, to, to the model. So you can try different models, but that does not help much in, uh, in training. Uh, for the method that I was showing, it, it must be a neural network and um, it, uh, Parameters of this neural network will vary, and you will learn them through, through interaction with the environment and through the algorithm. Um, but in principle, you could use OSIM RL with any other uh, policy model that you like, and with any other training of the parameters. So yes, you can change it, but that's that won't help you that much from our experience so far. But that's uh, definitely an active area of, of research now. Okay, so we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, now a question from Ian Danforth. Um, so do you see a faster version of OpenSim coming out in the near future? Um, I mean, from a, so speaking from the OpenSim development side, you know, that is something that we're, you know, with each release we're um, trying to focus on is improving computation speed. Uh, I think it's a balance here because you know there are some faster dynamics engines but then you start to move away from being physiologically and physically accurate like if you start to get sloppy with uh, how you model in contact for example or you don't include the physiologically accurate muscle models um, you know so it's it's open sim will never be as fast as an engine that's that's not uh, completely physically accurate, but um, 
we are researching, for example, ways to make contact modeling faster but still uh, be physically accurate. So let me just add one thing. So um, the question about speed is actually a question of, uh, so, so the, the, the problem is not necessarily in speed here. The problem of using open stream in the more reinforcement learning world is that reinforcement learning requires a lot of uh, simulations. So the final simulation, once you have your model trained, is actually fast enough for any practical. The problem is the training of your, your model. So um, we are exploring methods for just training a simplified version uh, or like very you know, constrained version of OpenSIM where we can run simulations much faster. And then at the very end, just fine tune it for the final simulation where you want to really have this physiological uh, accuracy. Uh, so I think it's not on the, 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 the problem here is not only about speed of open machine, but the entire infrastructure and, and the entire um, algorithm design. Um, and uh, there are many opportunities to, to train those controllers faster without um, making uh, open sim uh, like 110 times faster. So there are uh, definitely, again, like things to, to explore from the research side in engineering as well. Great, thanks. Uh, so we'll take one more question. Uh, this is from Vishal again. Uh, so I did see that there are muscle and kinematic data provided on the home page. How could we use it to help train the model? So that's something that we are uh, also thinking in the lab how to solve. Uh, so there are multiple ideas that we have right now. So first we could try to design an objective function uh, that matches the kinematics. So just you penalize um, not being close to, to the kinematic data. Another idea is to pre-train network on output of some inverse dynamics uh, procedure. So you get the kinematics data, from kinematics data you infer muscle on activity, and then you build a neural network in a supervised manner where you try to predict um, the muscle activity from uh, the kinematics data. Uh, and then from this, you use this as a starting point for the reinforcement learning algorithm. Uh, so, so those are two ideas, uh, but we are, you, you can try many other things as well. And that's also that we, we uh, left it open on purpose in some sense so that people can really uh, try their own ideas for this problem. Okay, so we better go ahead and wrap up. Thank you everyone for the really great questions uh, and discussion afterwards here. Oops, I'm going okay. backwards. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we took care of questions. Uh, I want to acknowledge our funding support from the National Institutes of Health, National Institutes of Health in the U.S. Um, you can learn more about Open Sim in general at our website, uh, and we encourage you to fill out the survey that it will appear after the webinar ends. So you can give us feedback on the webinar itself and give us ideas for future topics. I will also follow up the webinar with an email that has links to all the things we talked about today. Uh, so thank you again, Lucas. Thank you to everyone who participated uh, and asked so many great questions. Um, we'll see